A little over two weeks ago, we had our last devotional on what is true biblical conversion. And today, I'd like to finish up that series. This will be the first, fourth installment on what is biblical conversion. And I'd like to start off today by reading a couple of passages. The first one is Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And then Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Well, in my last three devotionals on what is biblical conversion, my goal was to contrast what men think conversion is all about and, and contrast that with what is biblical conversion. In all three of the previous devotionals, I wanted to stress that true biblical conversion is, one, a supernatural event, and secondly, that changes not only our destination, but our position before God as a work of God. In true conversion, as we saw in our last three devotionals, we are a new creation, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 15, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. So biblical conversion is, first of all, an event that brings about a new work of creation in our lives. The old man dies at the cross, and a new man is birthed by the regenerating of the Spirit of God. And secondly, you come from, as I've already alluded to, from death to life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Or Ephesians chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of the flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And in our third devotional, we notice that conversion then is not a work of man, but rather it is a work of of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Titus chapter 3 verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, the words of our Lord to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So as the reformers clearly argued, our conversion is a work of God's grace and His grace alone. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love, with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. But the question then comes up, what about man's responsibility? Is there 
not a response from man to the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God? And the answer to that question, actually to both, is yes, there is. And our two texts speak clear to the, clearly to that when they speak of repentance and faith. And so, biblical and true repentance, the Greek word metanoia, means in its essential meaning, a change of mind. And in a theological and ethical sense, a fundamental and thorough change in the hearts of men from sin toward God. 1 Thessalonians 1.9 gives a perfect description of that. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. And although faith alone is the condition for salvation, as we read in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, and Acts chapter 16, verse 31, repentance is bound up with faith in an inseparable from it. Since without some measure of faith, no one can truly repent. And repentance never attains its deepest character till the sinner realizes through saving faith how great is the grace of God against whom he has sinned. And on the other hand, there can be no saving faith without true repentance. And so repentance contains as essential elements, first, a genuine sorrow toward God on account of sin. That was David's testimony in Psalm 51, verses 3 and 4. For I acknowledge my transgression, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned, and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak, and blameless when you judge. You see, David understood that even though he had sinned with Bathsheba, the real sin was he had sinned against a holy and righteous God. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance, for you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. And thirdly, an inward revulsion to sin necessarily followed by the actual forsaking of it. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 8. Therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance. And Acts chapter 26 and verse 20. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and then the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting of repentance. And lastly, Hebrews chapter 6 verse 1. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. And so here the writer of Hebrews is saying that these Hebrew readers needed to repent of trying to gain salvation through works. He called it dead works, that they needed to repent of that and rather put their faith toward the saving work of Christ on Calvary's cross. And fourthly, repentance is a humble self-surrender to the will and service of God. Acts chapter 9, verse 6, the Apostle Paul, when he found himself confronted by the Lord, said, trembling and astonished, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? 
Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. True repentance always brings about a changed life and a desire to serve the Lord that redeemed him. You see, the saving faith, which is spoken of in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, is about, one, an acknowledgement of our sins and our inability, and our inability, excuse me, to save ourselves. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And secondly, it trusts in the work of Christ alone on Calvary's cross, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. But the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Or as Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. And again, that same idea is stressed in Colossians 1.20, and by him to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. But in the mysteries of God, we must also remember that both faith and repentance are gifts of God alone. Notice what Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says about faith. For by grace have you been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God. What is the gift of God in that passage? Every single thing, including faith itself. And then Paul, in 2 Timothy, as he speaks about repentance, he says this, in humility, correcting those who are, opposed, who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. You see, in the end, true biblical conversion from start to finish is a work of God. It is a work of God's grace. Our faith and our repentance are gifts from God. We are a new creation, created and regenerated by the Spirit of God. We were once dead in sin, but made alive by that same regenerating work. And this was all by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ.